Hey guys, guess what? Mia can fly and she's gonna be joining Mikey in the air soon. We wanted all the help we could get to set her up to successfully free fly. So we literally had the best chat ever with Jamie Lee and Dave from Bird Tricks, who are probably one of the best bird behavior and free flight trainers in the world. Now this is nothing like any of our other videos we have done before. And we are so stoked to be able to finally share an educational piece with you guys. We literally had an hour and 20 minute chat with them, which we've managed to cut down to 29 minutes. And this info is absolutely going to blow your mind. Enjoy! Bertrix! Hey. hey guys, what's up? Hey, Thank you so you much doing? for giving us some time to help Mia. How are you guys? I'm uh, doing great, thanks. How are you? Cool, well, not yeah, too bad. Good. Thanks for asking. So as you guys know, we're trying to basically help this beautiful bird over here get her wings to free flight. She was clipped at fledging, she was stuck in a cage, no toys or anything like that. She's slowly coming around to being a bit more social and she can do indoor recall and she's nailing it but she's just completely stuck outside. Now, mm. most of our subscribers have said talk to you guys so that's exactly what we're doing. So, help! <laughs> awesome, well, you called on a perfect day. We're down in Las Vegas. We were just out free flying with a bunch of friends and new clients and this is the kind of stuff that we really, we love. We, we love when people reach out with birds that are clipped wings or rescues and and that I love that you're asking how do you free fly train a bird that's clipped because most people think you clip the wings to keep it from flying but the reality is you've discovered they can still fly so yeah. that's um, crazy. hats off to you guys for wanting to pursue that we're stoked to help you out and basically what are your guys's goals um, if you had to pick a top one or top three goals with Mia what are they what are you looking to accomplish uh, well I wanted to try and get her free flying by sort of the end of May, which I think might be a little bit unrealistic, but. What we want is we want to set her up like a proper free flighted bird. So what we did with Mikey, because we didn't discover what free flight was until like a year and a half of having him, we learned off a guy who was free flying. It was literally just chatting back and forth for like four and a half months or something like that. And Continuous chatting. Loads amazing. of trial and error. So I know there's a lot of science behind this and everything mm. like that, and a lot of actual theory and learning, which we, just did so much different stuff and yeah. now we have a bird who We've tried it all he it's great he'll stay inside which is amazing like we can fly him built up areas there's houses all around we can throw him out the window it's great don't um, say that, don't say that. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds so bad. You guys throw your bird out the window? <laughs> About his downfalls on this. Yeah. He always wants to fly to playgrounds and yeah. he loves children and we hate that because children want to play with him and we can't have him biting any more kids. We've had enough parents scream at us. And I totally thought you were going to say we hate children. I thought so. you were going to say that too. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> John dropped her. We also want, she's super, super nervous at the moment. We want her to gain confidence. Tips, far away. <laughs> well, first of all, what do her wings look like? Does she have all of her flight feathers in now, or how clipped is like, she currently? She's missing four on one side and two on another. When we had her, she was missing about 14. <laughs> she couldn't move then. She couldn't even step up or... Yeah, it was terrible. Oh. So we did a bit of trick... stick training? We did a bit of stick training with her. And is it stick training? Is it called stick training? Target, Target training. training. Target training! We should have known that. Yeah, we should have known that. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> so let's look at the challenge first of over socialization. So, socialization of the bird going to a person is going to be trained as a trick. So in other words, I will go to a stranger, I will control the entire setting. I'll say, go ahead and hold out your left hand, I'll put the bird on it, I'll ask if you don't pet the bird, and I'll take their camera, I'll take a picture, and then I recall the bird off of that person. That person, because I very clearly say, all I ask is you don't pet her, it does a couple of things. One, that person never is associated, like a stranger is gonna give the same kind of love that you're giving, right? Like, they yeah. don't get that. Also, by saying all I ask is you don't pet them, I get rid of 98% of the risk of the bird biting that person because they miss the signs that the bird didn't want to be pet anymore because they're not bird people, they just see this flying dinosaur and they're like, can I get a picture? So a lot of your viewers might be saying like, well, I don't want my bird to go to a stranger. So why would I train the bird to go to a stranger? And you're not. The difference is we're training the bird to come off of a stranger. We had a similar issue with Tusa. I don't know if you want to talk about that uh, when he had a, a huge issue with going to trees. Yeah, so we've kind of done the same thing. You know, it's, I think it's a lot, the pretty much the last thing that people think about is like, how do I get my bird to come from a tree? And it's the very yeah. first thing that we'll go work on. So at the very beginning of the session, 
we will start at the tree, not at the end of the session, which is where a lot of people uh, end up making a mistake. So like Dave said, the socialization, basically what that does and what it looks like is our birds, if I have Comet, my macaw on my arm, if you guys came up and you're like, what a cool macaw, can I hold him? And you just went up to grab him, he would bite the absolute hell out of you. He would tear you apart. He would tear into you. <laughs> However, if you said, hey, what a cool macaw, can I have a picture with him? And I said, sure. And I said, hold open your arm, you know, and I put him on your arm, he won't bite you in that circumstance. So the trick is when I set you there, it is okay. If that person comes and approaches you, it's not. So you really have to take the mystery out of it because with birds, anytime you say, don't do that, can't touch that, can't do this, can't go there, they're gonna want to do it. On the surface, you're like, I don't want my bird to go to strangers. True, but the bigger thing is that you want the bird to come back if it does land on a stranger. Yeah, so, that's amazing. I love that, Good yeah. Thought, yeah. What a good tip. Because we thought that... <laughs> we'll throw Mikey at strangers no, now. No, because we started doing it with trees. Like, we, yeah. like, the first few times when we started free flying him, I think we did three overnights in two weeks. You know, 4.30 in the morning, 5 a.m. wake ups, off to find him, because it was terrible. And then I think Caleb, who taught us, he was just like, he's allowed to go on trees just as long as he comes back. So throw him in more trees, throw him in low trees, throw him in medium trees, throw him in high trees. As long as he'll come back, leave him in a tree. Just teach him to come back. So we were like, all right. So literally, I'm sure the week after, we just went to a park and then um, just kept throwing him up trees. And then we literally just worked tree recall about a good month or something, good right? Yeah. yeah. Not to take away from people that are free flying baby macaws, right? Because there's everybody's got to learn. That's a great way to learn how to free fly. But the challenge is that almost anybody can succeed free flight training a baby bird with very little knowledge. And so hats yeah. off to you guys for reaching out and saying like, okay, we we don't know something, so let's expand the growth. Because what happens is once the bird's out of that baby phase, people are like, now what? It's amazing that you guys work with like older birds and clip birds. A lot yeah. of people don't do that. And yeah. like the thing is with us, I mean, we're not against breeding of any sort, but it's quite sad that every single day I see a photo on some sort of social media. Here's my brand new baby macaw. And then straight under it, I have to rehome my bird. Who wants it? And that bird was like one to two years old and I'm like, all right, something needs to be done here. And that's kind of been like, you know, at least my mission when I work with these project birds, as I call them, and I take them on and I make it so that they're trainable for, for somebody else to take on, is that like, I'm trying to prove that you can do it with clipped birds and older birds and like, look at the birds yeah. that you already have. Don't think about how you have to go get a baby to do things. I want people to take a second look at those older birds, those clipped birds, those imperfect birds, um, because yeah. so much is achievable with them. We even were talking with a bird person the other day who was just like, oh, you know, I don't really have a good free flight candidate. And it's like, okay, <laughs> if I were to ask you, is a 45 year old obese Amazon a good free flight candidate? It eats cheeseburgers oh. for every meal. Most You're people kidding. would say absolutely not. You know, like they would say no way. And that bird was trained in 45 days. Like that's literally how long it took me to transform that bird. And, that's and so you know, cool. the, the other one was like a seven year old handicapped Camelot macaw who couldn't even perch. Like, does that sound like a good free flight candidate? Nope, <laughs> but it took four months and then she's transformed and doing the same thing. And so I really like push people to take a second look, especially with the clipped birds. I hate for them to have like this false perception of, oh, we missed the window of opportunity, it's over. You know, I want yeah. them to do what you guys are doing and say like, hey, no, how can we make it happen? There's gotta be a way and find it. Honestly, with flight, a lot of what happens is once you can encourage a bird to do it and use it as a means of transportation, then it becomes self-rewarding and you don't have to work as hard, you know? And neither does the bird because they're enjoying the whole process. That's what she's just started doing, enjoying yeah, flying. She's, before she absolutely well, hated it, and now she she just flies to me and flies back now. to tell me, come on, we need to do some training the now. Last, the last two weeks, she can actually yeah. get from A to B without sitting there going for five Aww. minutes until someone picks her up, and she sits there with this sad face on, and she's like, ah. Ah, and just waiting for someone to come pick her up. She can I do very short Because I wanted her to enjoy it, and we never kind of forced her or threw her to the perch. We, I always gave her the option because I knew she'd eventually enjoy it. And now she wants to train more than Mikey ever did, but only literally in this room, like backyard. As soon as we're ish, outside. But any park we go to, and that's one thing I wanted to ask you guys: Should we be training her with him? Like, if we go to a park, he's flying around doing his thing. Should we be doing recall with her? at that point or trying with her or should we do a completely solo? 
I think there's two things to touch on. And the, the first one I wanna to touch on is the, the latter part of your question, like should you train them together? This is very specific to each and every bird. So if I'm gonna give you an example that I just discovered with my Camelot Macaw Comet. He prefers to train solo and he does so much better solo and he's so much happier. And the second I give him competition and bring another bird, he quits. However, with Morgan, that handicapped macaw I was talking yeah. about, she was incredibly motivated by the presence of another bird. So if she wasn't responding to me very well, I would go grab my macaw Jinx, put him there, and she was like, oh, nope, I'm gonna be first, I'm gonna be there, and it motivated her in a positive way. So I got a better outcome from her, where I would get a worse outcome from Comet. So the exact same training technique, but has different effect on each bird. So that's something that you're gonna have to really play with and discover for her. The other thing to look at is when you look at the training quadrant, um, which we have a great reference in our video, the family friendly parrot formula, it talks about positive and negative reinforcement, positive and negative punishment. And reinforcement for people that aren't aware increases a behavior, desired or not, it increases behavior, where punishment decreases behavior. Positive reinforcement is giving something, negative reinforcement is taking something away. It's not mean, it's just you're removing something to increase behavior. So keep in mind that we're wanting to work in the reinforcement area. So if flying the two macaws together, if you think it's reinforcing and the bird thinks it's punishment, doesn't matter what you think in that situation, you're going to, by definition, punishment decreases the behavior, you'd be decreasing yeah. the likelihood for that behavior. It depends on her mood, but sometimes she's encouraged if Mikey's there, and sometimes she'll just sit. So I, I'm not sure if it's the the other part of her surroundings, or the park, or just dependent on the actual place. I, I honestly think it's the surroundings. Yeah, our local park where yeah. we go daily, I mean, she just literally freezes, doesn't she? She, she just, just won't move. Honestly, just... to me, it sounds like a lack in desensitization and a lack in proper confidence building. It mm -hmm. seemed like that. Like, she's yeah. been outdoors, like, we fly him, what, five days a week? Ish, on I mean, average, I, I, and she comes out every flight. There was a phase where for about two weeks I literally just went away with her to the garden and for the first sort of few days she'd sit and not move for about half an hour and then maybe fly to me and latch on to me and not want to go back. And then by day four she was straight away, not, not even sort of waiting or looking around, she was just straight away flying to me. As soon as we go to that park, she just doesn't want to, she doesn't want to move. It's just, we, we can't really like you get off. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I'm, I mean, we're really trying with the desensitization, but I, I feel like, I don't but know, maybe there's something else as the well. The thing is, we yeah. weren't too worried just for the fact, I mean, Mikey took forever. We took him out for a year and a half before we oh. started flying him, but it was just the recall with him. And then when he got it, he was like, all right, that's all I have to do. That wasn't too scary. So we hope that's what uh, yeah, happens. But we were just wondering, is there, is point. there anything to kind of, I mean, we don't want to rush help. it, but yeah. you know, help the confidence building in the desensitization, that whole realm of. Um, well, I think one of the things that you guys said that stuck out to me is that she recalls perfectly in that room. And so I think you need to expand that space of that room. Like, is she going from the floor and doing ascending? Is she doing descending? Is she going around a corner? Is she doing out of sight? Like, how can you expand that? So obviously that's her comfort zone is that room. And however you can make it work to expand that throughout is going to be huge in desensitization and incorporating those distractions. So I know you're saying like, oh, she works great when it's just me, no distractions. Now you need to start adding distractions and getting that same response. You need to get that 98% response from her with one more added distraction. Now with two, now with multiple. Does that make sense? And expand it yeah, inside yeah. before you jump outside and say, holy world of distractions, go. Yeah. Yes, yeah. It's too yeah. much of a big jump for her, and I think that's what's happening. Although you have a great training session with her, just solo you, no distractions, like, can you have a great training session if he's looking in? Can you have a great training session if he's doing a little dance in the corner? You know, like just little things. Because we want to build confidence. We want her to go into the desensitization process as though she came out of it. The more you do it, the easier they'll desensitize. Like the quicker, they'll just be like, oh, I know this. 
this is a thing where yeah, I just show down. calm behavior and then it's all good and, and you'll start seeing it and then you can transfer that outside so you could take her on a walk and when somebody zooms by on a skateboard and she doesn't even care you can click and give a reward and she's just gonna be like cool I get rewarded for being calm and chill and not caring about all this chaos that's why we tried to take her to the garden but I think even doing that in the garden as well and then trying yeah. to take her out may may help a lot actually that's a very good point we we'll definitely try that Think of it as, as small approximations. If you're teaching the spin, you don't just point at the bird and expect her to spin. You do it in baby steps, right? First it's a little over here, then it's a little over here, and then a little more. So think of adding distractions like that. To build and expand on her confidence, you have to get her out of her comfort zone. And to do that, you really need to understand treat value and using a slightly higher value or changing a few things so the motivation is higher. That doesn't necessarily mean um, making her hungrier. It could just mean a better treat at the end. Yeah, for example, it looks like she's very overly bonded yeah. to you, to the wife here, um, <laughs> yeah. and that you are kind of not so much. <laughs> um, and so she what that would mean, she, like what Dave's saying and what that would mean is that she may not have to use a treat to get Mia to fly to her. She might be the treat. Whereas yeah. you, you definitely might need that food reinforcement to be like, hey, I swear it's worth it. You're gonna love this. <laughs> um, Funny, so, so that's kind of where he's coming yes. from. Do you guys currently use food rewards for your training? Oh, yeah, so treats. indoor recall, we do pine nuts. Outdoor recall, almonds, just normal. Quite a third almond, bigger flights half, and then treat the whole ones. So yeah. that's basically how we do it. Cool, so that reveals okay. a lot for yeah, us. Yeah, that reveals a lot. <laughs> So you, you guys are very predictable to your birds. <laughs> every Yeah, so uh, you are doing what's referred to as FR1 or Frequency Reinforcement 1, which means every one trick, the bird gets one treat. The problem is your treats are too large. The pine nuts are about the size you want, or another example would be one almond cut into eight pieces. One wow. flight gets one eighth of an almond. Uh. Crazy. We've just learned so much. <laughs> <laughs> so, so look at it this way. For anybody that's like, oh, I don't want to withhold food from my bird, think of it this way. In the wild, your bird's flying around outside all day long in the hopes of maybe finding food. There's no guarantee. So the worst thing a parrot owner could do is clip the bird's wings, stuff it in a cage, and give it 24-hour access to food. And so I just want people to, to start to get that in their minds that like, oh no, it's actually more natural for my bird to work for food. But, and if you actually start yeah. charting how much they consume, you'll be shocked at how much food you're actually wasting. Yeah. The reason that birds thrive in the wild, one of the reasons obviously, is that they're mentally engaged all the time and physically engaged. They're having to fly and they're having to think on how to find the food. And so in captivity, that's why we are such advocates of free flight. They get to fly, see the exercise, and they're forced to think because they have to figure out, what time do I get my favorite treat? Is this how I get my favorite treat? Is that how I get my favorite treat? Because keep in mind, if the second favorite treat is a pine nut, you should use your pine nut for most of your outdoor flying. Because what's gonna happen, your birds are never gonna know when they might get the almond if the almond is the favorite treat. Yeah, so the number one is reserved for things that we really need or breakthrough moments. So the first time, for instance, Mia decides to take that flight on her own and do a boomerang and come back to you, jackpot. That's when you give the big reward because it's like, that is what I want. I want that behavior over and over and over again. That's when you can get it and then you continue with the secondary treats. So understanding treat value and how to give them and when to give them and how to keep it random is so important because a lot of people get very stuck. Like you guys are very predictable. I use this treat for this behavior, this treat for this behavior, <laughs> yeah. that treat for that behavior. Yeah, they that know gets this very stuff. boring for animals. So I'd encourage you and your viewers to right now just kind of think about like what routine do you currently have that's predictable? And you can leave it in the comments. And what can you do to make that less predictable? My well, other question is, <laughs> is there this kind of theory or way to getting a bird to do a, a circle or to do a loop? A boomerang. A boomerang, sorry, I don't really speak. That's, that's the technical <laughs> yeah, term. Sorry, which I we don't just know. learned. Yes, woo! woohoo! Thanks for that. We'll we were like that, that circle thing that they do yeah, when they just fly and come back. Like, is there a way to train that specific behavior? Because with Mikey it was a fluke, and with a few of the other <laughs> bird owners we know, they just got it. We ended up running around in circles. We'd start yeah, at the perch and run in like, a circle and be like, this it. is what you do. <laughs> Hey, it worked eventually. Don't make fun. <laughs> Predictable. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are.
Yeah, I've never I've, heard of the person actually running in the circle. Yeah. This is what I want you to do. Um, so yes, and there's a there's a few ways to do it. Do you want to chime in or do you mind if I do? You go ahead. So there's a few ways to do it. For the outdoor environment, what's very revealing is understanding the wind. So if you're trying to get a circle, go fly someplace for us. The desert yesterday had a steady 10 mile an hour wind from the south. So we would face the wind, we would face south, and we would allow the bird to fly into the wind. There's no way that that bird can just fly a straight line back to us with the wind pushing it. It's forced to do a circle because as soon as it turns to try to come back, the wind's gonna blow it behind us and it has to make that circle. So you can use the wind to your advantage within your bird's skill level, right? Don't be an idiot and go throw it in a 40 mile an hour wind downwind <laughs> and expect it to come back. I have to say these things sometimes. <laughs> but if it's a five to 10 mile an hour breeze, and I really encourage people to go buy a wind reader, you can get them for like $50 on Amazon, because the difference between 10 miles an hour and 15 miles an hour is Huge. significant. It is massive. If you fly in a steady 10, that bird has to do a circle to come back because it can't it can't not do that. Yeah. And then you would use a jackpot reward to say, hey, you know, here's here's three slivers of almond this time, or maybe here's a full <laughs> almond because that's a behavior we want to see more of, right? So you're adding reinforcement, a plus reinforcement, and it's a it's a larger amount. Now, the next time the bird does that circle, he might just give a pine nut. And the person's thinking, yeah. what the hell? I got an almond last time, so we'll do a bigger <laughs> circle. And that's where he gets another almond. So you wanna keep them on their toes thinking about how they can improve. If you guys get into a system where you chart your progress and you say, hey, this is a training session. We're setting ourselves up. We got this many repetitions. She started to lose interest at this. You guys will really be able to dial in and say, okay, she lost interest at repetition nine. Next time we're just gonna do seven really solid repetitions and end it before she ends yeah. it so that she's excited next time. If you can document five flights at 10 yards from this distance, the wind was out of the south, roughly zero to five miles an hour. Now you know how to make the next flight better. Rather than the bird only doing A to B flights from north to south, you could do cross wind flights, east to west, west to east, and you could do five of those flights. You have to look at that methodically if you want to just make your bird take off in Still a very level. calculated way and, and get them to the best flight levels possible, which is safer ultimately. So kind of have like a consistent structure and then using the wind as well, because we've never done any of those things. No, we never thought, well, we, we knew like, you know, let's throw them into the wind, lands on the wind, Because we've seen great. like a couple of people have completely different <laughs> like, techniques. It, Do you get a lot of birds of prey around where you are? Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. guys would, eh? When you have a confident bird, a confident flyer, it doesn't matter. The reality is there's predators for, at least for us, there's predators everywhere. So you wouldn't want to take a sick bird, a weak bird, a bird that's underprepared, a person that is underprepared. You need to set yourself up for success and part of that is making sure you're flying a happy, healthy, active bird. Uh, yeah. but, but the bald eagle is there the entire time but never came after our birds because we understand when raptors hunt in general, we studied all of that so we would never fly our parrots when the birds of prey are most likely to hunt. I would encourage everybody to, to study as much as you can about eagles and hawks and falcons and, and understand, the more you understand about how they hunt, the better and safer free flyer you will be. Taking our birds outside has risks, but managing those yeah. risks is really what it comes down to to and keep them safe. That's a crazy yeah. amount of like knowledge you guys have. That's amazing. Cause you've been- You guys been, have been doing this forever, right? You've been doing right? this for a long time. <laughs> we just got told that the other day. They're like, you guys are like the oldest. And we were like, wait, did you say yeah. old? <laughs> oh no, I didn't mean it like that. <laughs> you guys are so old, it's so old. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to just teach people to fly their birds outside. We want to teach people to become trainers and think through and troubleshoot and be able to problem solve their issues that they're going to have at home with their birds. Like we are in this for the long term relationship. I want to throw one more thing out that I've noticed and this is, uh, I, I don't I don't mean to call you guys out publicly for it, but it's something no, that- Do, that please every... Willa, we need to learn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, Love that. that everybody does. Uh, okay, so pet parrots should only be pet on the head and neck. Now for most birds, anything down here is no longer part of the neck, all right? Because that'll trigger sexual response. Yeah. You're getting a lot of regurgitation now. <laughs> Whenever we start to see like a sexual behavior, like we've seen it in macaws a year old, right? So it may look like a feeding response, but it also can be like, this could also be interpreted as sexual. 
So the challenge with that is you'll start to get a situation where you have a one person bird, right? And then you're going to get more territorial behavior, more biting, more screaming, more defensiveness, more aggression towards people, you know, approaching your man or your woman, right? And so uh, yeah. really be aware. I've seen both of you do it throughout this video. When you watch back and you're like, ah, oh, right? But yeah. uh, it, like touching the back, you should be able to touch or hold the back. Is the tail still bad? Like we stay away from like kind we of here down. We don't touch under the wings. We or... go like here to here. Maybe like, I do. We've heard of this. Because he likes to be preened on his tail. Is um, the tail okay? I know like the base of the tail's bad or is it just the whole tail we should stay away from? Like. Like, you should be able to examine. Like, I can pull, you know, the tail feathers apart yeah. and really examine them, right? But I'm not gonna stand there and st and stroke the tail. Let's, okay. To put I it, feel like I'm really talking okay. gross or something. I'm no, like, no, did I go too far? To put it very clearly, there's a fine line between when you go to the doctor and they do an exam versus when you go home with your spouse, and right? And they do an exam. You might be touching the same <laughs> spots, but you're getting a different reaction. But also, different triggers trigger birds differently. So for example, my blue-throated macaw Jinx, um, it's gonna sound so stupid, but I'm gonna hope that other pet owners do these ridiculous things that I do to my birds. But he would sit there and I would pat his head and go, buh, 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 buh. <laughs> uh, yeah, whatever guys, don't judge. And, um, and what I realized is that during this time of year, the patting on the head is almost like getting that regurgitation sort of thing because they they do like the and eventually it would shut up it would just it would How does that go again? normal response okay y'all I'm trying to teach here oh one more thing I just wanted to tell everyone because the amount of how do you tame your bird messages we get on a daily basis is ridiculous so this is there an answer on how to tame your bird here's the answer is as a pet Parrot owner, it is your responsibility to become the best trainer you can be. And whether that's through our information products, whether that's through our YouTube channel, or anybody else out there, all we are after is that people go out there and arm themselves with the best information they can because our motto is that we're saving birds one person at a time. And if we can get one person to learn a little bit more, then they can impact an infinite amount of birds, whether it's one person with a bird or one person with a flock. It all starts with improving your own knowledge. And so uh, I just wanna give credit to you guys for reaching out to continue your education. It's obvious you're passionate about what you do and you wanna see the best of your birds. And that's what I love is, is connecting with people like this on such a powerful platform who want to see that improvement. You're just setting an example for people that you'll never meet, that'll never say anything, but you know what? You're gonna make the biggest difference in their lives and that's where the power of this really is. One of our resources is our Family Friendly Parrot Training Course. It's an amazing way for people to be able to take their knowledge from very entry level to expert as quickly as possible. And that came from doing years and years of consults, answering the same questions a thousand times to where we got to the point where it's clear, it's concise, it's illustrated, it's animated, and it's visual. And it's a 12 step program to, to fix your bird's behavior problems by making you the best trainer. And just to kind of see yeah. that you guys are basically out there just getting more and more birds in the sky. Like it's really, Makes really, really cool. Makes us very happy. Yeah. 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 Aww, thank awesome, thank you. We are happy to help you. Let me push you guys to encourage you to stay on track with this and, and declare what your goal is here in front of the entire YouTube world, your community, our community. What is your goal and what's your plan to get there? Okay, so Mia Free Flight is the number one goal. Do, do we need to put a date down now or? So yeah, when do you want her in the air by? I'm gonna say uh, latest end of August. From what you guys are saying, I think we need to do a lot more desensitization outside and I don't wanna push her and then have her I don't know. I don't know. I might be wrong. I we want to be more careful this time. Yeah, we want to be more careful. I'm not when... saying we rushed it with Mikey. I mean, we did. Four and a half months from start to end. Loads of overnight sleep. Loads yeah. of overnight sleep. Yeah. If I put a deadline for free flight of June 1st, two month window roughly, what would your day look like in order to achieve that goal in two months? Put our treats down to like eights. We'll work more on indoor. Fill indoor with distractions before we go outdoor. Just so she's so super ready. So that's the goal of ours is yeah. desensitizing Mia inside. Desensitizing you in the garden and then starting the just Monday and Wednesday and Friday, yeah. maybe. And then just do more and more and more as time yeah. goes on. So, Jamie and Dave, thank you very much for being with us here today. It's been a lovely experience. We're gonna literally take everything you've said and just smash it out throughout the week. And hopefully have me in the sky by the 1st of June. 1st of June is our goal. Is our goal. Yeah. So thank you guys so, so much. Yeah, we're excited to see your progress. Guys, definitely go check out Bird Tricks. There'll be links below, so click them. It'll be good for you.
the Goofy of Birds. Thank you guys again for helping so many birds through your channel, your inspiration. And even if people don't want to take the birds outdoors free flying, I hope there's a lot of lessons for people to do preventative training through indoor flight training. So if the bird ever does get out, they know how to get it back. But and just uh, improve their overall relationships long term. So, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Let's go. See you, See you guys later. See ya. Bye. Yeah. Sweet. And cut. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even wearing pants in this interview.